We have a strict rule in our house. No cats on the chairs. Buster, are you napping in a place you're not supposed to nap? You see, it's working out pretty well, isn't it? Hmm? What are you doing, Buster? You see, really, Buster owns the place. Just leave me alone. All right, Buster. And you'd be really smart. Are you supposed to be uh, not... Uh, you're not supposed to be sleeping on that chair, Buster. You'd be really smart if you didn't bug Buster while he's resting. <laughs> he said, don't pet me, I'm sleeping. Leave me alone. He doesn't have a lot of patience for people that come along to annoy him. <laughs> Why do you let him on your chair? I didn't let him on my chair. I've been kicking him off all day. That is coming. No, I'm not stupid. All right, how about we get to work now? Okay, guys, check it out. We are going to do a little baking today. Um, yes, this is my toaster oven. Wifey, I tried to use Wifey's toaster oven one time, and uh, she caught me in the act, and that was the end of that. There was no using Wifey's toaster oven. Uh, truth is, I really wouldn't want to use it for what I'm about to do. What we have in here is that, that metal capacitor block, that metal box capacitor block that goes on the, uh, um, um, goes on the Grunau 501. And we're going to bake this and get all the tar out of this thing. This is how I get the tar out of these. No, none of this playing with a heat gun for me or freezing it or any of that garbage. I wrap it with aluminum foil because that will keep the heating element from scorching the paint on this. It won't it won't cool it off, but it'll keep it from scorching if, there's, if they're painted. Sometimes they're not, they are, sometimes they're not. I don't want any scorching anyway, so I put the aluminum foil on. I also protect the wires for the same reason. Again, it doesn't keep them from changing completely if they're going to change, but I'm replacing these wires anyway. But I do want to keep them from scorching because I want to try to be able to see the color. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the oven on. Let's, uh, I don't know if this, I've got to plug it into a power strip, so it may kick the it may kick the breaker on the power strip, but we'll see. All right, so let's, uh, let's put this thing in there. There we go. Let's see what happens. All right, now I'm starting at 400 degrees. I usually wind up bumping it up to about 425. But um, what this will do, eventually, all of that tar will just drain right out of this thing. It'll start to kind of glob out of it in about five or ten minutes and then it will all just drain out and uh, it works uh, it works really well you can buy cheap toast this is a black and decker it's actually a really good little toaster oven you can buy cheap toaster ovens at thrift stores all day long for 10 or 15 dollars you go buy one of those and you've got it for the rest of your life um, i also use it for uh, getting the wax out of capacitors, you know, paper and wax capacitors. Again, I wrap it with foil to keep from scorching the paper. Of course, you don't want to do this with, with uh, plastic cased capacitors, but with paper and wax, you can do this, and it'll melt the wax right out and pretty fast, too. And usually it won't harm the tube. And then you just, you know, you wipe the tube off when you're done, and off you go. You want to be careful when you're wiping it because that wax will act as a solvent and take the ink off from the paper if you're not real gentle about it. So think about all these things, but definitely this is a good way, at least with these metal cans, these potted cans, getting this stuff out of here. One more caution, if there is a choke or any kind of a transformer inside that can, you can't do this. You don't want to heat that up as hot as it takes to get this stuff out of there because you'll probably damage the... The, uh, the varnish on the windings if you did that. Now, I've not ever, I don't have any experience that says that for sure. I'm just guessing that, that my best judgment says don't do it if you've got some kind of a coil like a, a choke or a transformer in there. Only for getting it out of like foil and paper capacitors. So let's let this bugger go for a little while and see what we get. And uh, I'll turn the camera back on once we've made some progress. On this particular capacitor, this thing had been leaking so badly that I that there was tar all on the bottom and I couldn't even see that there was a bottom cover plate. Some have them and some don't. I should have seen these little tabs that I'm folding up now, but the truth is these even these tabs were all covered with tar and I didn't see that they were even there. So what I've got to do now is kind of get this bottom cover plate off of here, otherwise the tar won't drain out properly. 
Now I originally left these nuts on here so that it would help clean the threads of the screws when I when I remove them, but I'm going to just have to remove them anyway and just clean the threads manually because they're going to block me taking this little plate off the bottom. Now I'm not going to reuse the little plate, but but I still don't want to tear it up while I'm removing it. Oh well, I'm going to get my gloves all filthy. That's all right. It suggests that I've actually done some work if my gloves are dirty. I once went to a job interview as an engineer. I went to a job interview and he was looking for a field engineer and I had been a, a field engineer of sorts at the power plant. So the first thing that he did when I sat down to talk to him is he said, let me see your hands. And I'm serious, this was a professional interview. Let me see your hands. Okay, so I showed him my hands. He said, okay, yeah, you got some calluses and some dirt. All right, you know how to work. And that meant a lot to this guy. But I, as a field engineer, I guess, you know, he understood, as do I, that there's often, you often have a lot of physical work. You're climbing or you're having to actually do some of the manual work on the equipment. All right, you see the mess in there. It's, uh, there's a lot of capacitors inside this thing, and this tar... Hey, check that out, guys. They're all, all lifting out because I got the tar good and hot. There's all the caps. Good, I don't have to worry about scorching the wires now. There's the ground wire. I still... There's a little divider. I don't know if that's another cap or not. I still want to clean this thing out. So here's the remains of one of the caps. It started to unroll itself. Pretty cool. That's like a little ground deal. But anyway, I'm going to heat this up. This should happen a lot faster now. I didn't realize they were going to slip right out of there like that. So that's one approach, too, you could try. I typically just drain the stuff out, and then it comes out pretty clean. And then I don't have to worry about it. But if you want to pull them out like that, that works too. Whatever, whatever you want to do, man. This is, your, this is your story you're writing. Go ahead and write it. So let me, let me set that on here. And uh, get that foil so I don't scorch it right where it's going to be visible. It should be fine. I don't, I don't see any signs of scorching. But all right, we're going to turn that back on. Cook it for a few minutes more. And uh, we, should, uh, we should see a nice clean box come out of there in a few minutes. While we wait for that capacitor to cook, let me show you what I picked up when I was down in southern Utah the other day. Now, I don't do very many of these, hey, looky what I got videos anymore because, frankly, I don't want to bore you guys. And I don't want you to think that like all I ever do is go buy crap. Um, I do buy a lot of stuff. I'm an avid collector and I also know, I recognize that I'll probably never get to restore all the stuff I buy. But I can live with that because somebody will restore it someday and I'm just, it's my job to kind of keep the stuff decent until then, keep it in good shape and, and care about whether it sits out in the sun or weather or whatever or, or sits in a nice place where it's going to be protected. I find a lot of stuff that uh, I buy from people that's in their garages or um, hell, this stuff was sitting outside that I'm going to show you here. It's a, it's a wonder that it survived as well as it did, but it is southern Utah and it's a very dry climate. And it was sitting under a trailer outside, so it didn't have the sun beating on it. So let me show you what it is. It says old car radio. Okay, cool. I've been looking to get deeper into car radios. I've done a bunch of car radios and I really like doing them. There's something about them that I just think is cool and they often sound really, really good. So let me show you what this is. First off, this old car radio has a separate speaker. All right, and it's, uh, it's, on, it's, it's, this, it's in this kind of weird, kind of funky cardboard housing that I have to be, I'll have to be real careful with. That's not a metal housing or a plastic housing. It's a weird kind of cardboard. I used to see in cars a lot, kind of like masonite, but it's not quite as strong as masonite is. All right, um, I'm trying to get the, uh, I thought the speaker connects your, connect, yep, it's, it's disconnected. So let me pull this out. 
I'm going to show this all to you. So this thing does not have a speaker built into the box for the radio like a lot of radios do. It's separate like this. All right, so there's that. And then check this out, man. This thing here, it's called a Motorola Model 709 Golden Voice. Really cool. This here, I'm so surprised that this thing is not broken or cracked or beat up. I'm going to leave it just how it is. It's just, it's a big metal box. See, there's a connector that goes there. Rayalco has a million of those kind of connectors, so I'm good there. Uh, battery ground looks like, uh, not sure what, uh, it might be voice coil. So that connects to the, I don't know, maybe that VC stands for voice coil. It connects to the speaker. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but anyway, let's uh, let's take a look at a little deeper into it. It's model 709, as I said. It's just this big box. But wait a minute. This box, the only thing that looks anything like a knob is this guy right here. And I'm not sure what that is. I, I turned it, which was probably stupid. But uh, there we go. It's just this knob. And under here, you see the chassis. It's kind of a quirky looking chassis. Very strange, gigantic. Uh, looks like a band switch, but I'm not, I don't, I don't know much about it. Maybe this sets, you know, it helps with alignment. Who knows? I've got to find out about all this. I don't know what that is. It's a fascinating little radio. Oh, by the way, the Motorola Model 709 was made about 1952. Ah, here we go. It's dated. I, for, I forgot, most Motorola stuff is. April looks like 19th, 1949. This thing was made in 49, in the first half of 49, so that's very cool. Some vent holes all over it. So there's that, but wait a minute, still we don't know how to control the thing, right? Well, you probably guessed it. This is meant to be mounted in the trunk, and this here goes under the dash. Now this is cool. This is just, this just turns my crank, man. That is cool. It's got the knobs. All right, this knob actually controls a, a flexible cable. All right, you see that? So this knob, actually, there's no electronics for this knob in this box, just controlling this flex cable. Kind of like a speedometer cable. You see the, in fact, if I ever have to replace it, that's probably what I'll replace it with is a speedo cable. You see the square end of it. I did enough Volkswagen speedometers and I know what they look like. And the same for the tuning. So this tuning control is the same way. It's basically just controls a cable. But it does control, you can't see it very well, but I can. It does move the dial needle in there. So it is doing its job. Okay, so that's really, really cool. So this is literally a remote control. This thing has no electronic functions in it at all except maybe a light. And it does have these presets, these tuner presets. So these may be, this may be like a Zenith preset arrangement. So it's in the box and there's like capacitors and coils in there. And so you push this and it engages one of them. Because I do see a bunch of wires in this little harness here. They'll all be for the preset. So this will be a fun project because there will be this preset, this, this whole assembly here to restore, that speaker box to, to you know, kind of check out and restore, and of course this main chassis. This thing does have the original connector, and uh, it looks to be in decent shape. I don't think I'll have any problems, you know, making that work, all right? And I have seen these on eBay. Every now and then I'll see, like, the chassis or I'll see this. I seldom see them together. I'm just happy to have a complete unit. And I got it cheap, what I consider cheap. I paid $30 for it at an antique store. And uh, I'm really, really happy to have it because I love old car radios. I don't know how well you can see this thing, but I picked up this car radio here. This is another old Motorola. The dial's a little bit messed up. It's weird, the ink. It's not really ink. These letters here kind of peeled off of the plastic complete. I may be able to recover these numbers and get them positioned back in their right places and get them to stay there. I don't know. I'm going to have to try. 
But what we have here is another Motorola radio, looks like model 403. And uh, I'm not sure when this is made. From the looks of it, probably late 50s, early 60s, something like that. But definitely a neat radio. Um, you know, I got this thing for 20 bucks and you know, it has a speaker built in, so it is a complete unit. It is, there's nothing missing on this and uh, everything works smoothly on it. This thing hasn't spent any time outside, so I'm real happy about that. This should be pretty cool. Let's see, let's check on that oven. No, it's still not dripping that much, so it's a day for Motorola's. Five dollars. Got this for five bucks. This is uh, a Motorola uh, plastic radio. I'm sure it's a battery set. Um, I have I know nothing about it, and you can't see the dial needle, but the dial needle is here, and the numbers are all around here. This thing's pretty rough, but cool thing is there's no cracks in this. This is taped closed because maybe uh, I'm oops I'm wrong. When I looked at it the other day, I didn't see one. There's a crack right here. So I'm going to have to fix that, but that's in a, in a spot that's not that visible. This will be fine. Um, so I'll, do, I'll use old Buzz 1151's body shop trick or old 64 Gold, Goat's body shop trick on this little crack, and that'll take care of it. Definitely a, a, a 50s radio plastic. I love the logo. I'm not sure when they changed from this logo to the later one, but that would kind of date this machine. The last radio I picked up at that same antique store is this guy right here. It's in pretty rough shape. It needs a lot. This cabinet's going to need some TLC. But uh, this is an Emerson. Very cool little, little radio design. I like it. This is a wood cabinet. It's not plastic. But it is painted. It looks like it's painted like, an, like a dark brown lacquer. So um, I'm not sure if that paint's original or not. It has a back on it. I haven't yet tried to open it up. Looks like it's a model 504. So I'm not sure what year this is made. Eh, I'm looking at it, I'm guessing sometime, I'm guessing late 40s, you know, 47, 48, something like that. This plastic just slides off, which is kind of weird. But uh, I've, I've, you know, I'll figure this out too. This is a project whenever, you know, someday down there, somebody I know will want a tabletop and I'll fix it up for them. I have way more radios than I can ever use. So, you know, I'll, I'll you know, some, one of the nieces or nephews will want a cool old radio. And so I'll, that's when I'll, I'll find this buried in the stash somewhere and I'll prep this for them. But until then, it gets, it's out of the weather and it gets taken care of. And that's sort of my mission. So that's what I found. I think that that, uh, that capacitor block's probably about done cooking. And I hope you don't mind indulging me and allowing me to show you these, these radios. Um, I, I really enjoy the car radio thing. So I'm looking for more car radios and I really love the, the, I have had a few that I've restored for folks and I've really enjoyed it. It's funny, the car people, they, uh, they love they love their radios, but if they, if they can't get a radio restored to original, they'll go ahead and change it to some modern contraption that they, that they just shove into the original box. And I hate that. So um, every radio that I can restore for somebody to uh, an original or very close to original spec is one that doesn't get, uh, you know, doesn't get bastardized with a bunch of modern crap shoved into the box. So uh, I, I look forward to doing more and more car radios. The most recent one I did was out of a 49 Cadillac. And uh, that radio just sounded phenomenal when it was done. And believe it or not, they actually pull some current. Those things move some, some power. That's, it's a six volt radio and that radio pulled about seven amps. And I have a beefy power supply that, that juiced it up. So I wish I'd made a video of that, but I wasn't making videos at the time. All right, now that we're done taking a look at my new junk, and this has been in here for a while, plenty of, plenty of smoke coming up out of this box. Uh, let's take a look and see where we are. Whew. It does make a smell, guys. If you do this, do it in your garage. You do it in your, in your basement, your wife will have a fit. Uh, I, ask me how I know that. Um, let me try something. Let me put this back in for just a minute. I'm going to grab a handful of paper towels, see if I can't wipe out the rest of that tar. All right, what you're going to need to wipe the rest of that out of there, some paper towel and a big screwdriver. 
and uh, maybe a gas mask. So you, you take this guy, it should have been ready, and you just shove a wad of paper towels down in there, and real quick, while it's still hot, you wipe it out. Alright, and you get that tar out of there, and uh, sometimes you have to do more than one iteration of, of heating and wiping. Oh, that's what was in there. Okay, so it's messy, guys. This is, uh, but it's less messy than doing it on your workbench with a heat gun. All right, don't be stingy with the paper towels. I won't tell any of the environmentalists if you don't. Um, just think about all the resources you're saving by reusing this old radio. Okay, and really, you, it doesn't have to be perfectly clean. That's going to be up to you. I don't need it to be perfectly clean. I just want to be able to work with it. And so I get it clean enough to work with. And it'll stay hot long enough to do a little bit of this and getting it clean. You see, you can kind of see it looks pretty good. Now there's, there's a cardboard piece in there that acts as an insulator from the metal. You want to kind of leave that in there. And the truth is, you want you, there was one at the top too, and you like that in there as well. So I will often put those back while the tar is still sticky, and that way they'll stay in place. So there you go. I don't know if you can see down in there. Let's see if we can shine a light on it for you. You see down in the box, it isn't perfectly clean, but it's pretty darn good. I'll get the rest with lacquer thinner. And uh, while it's still hot, it doesn't hurt to wipe off what you can. Maybe turn off the oven, don't need it anymore. Dinner's ready. And if you think of it, wipe off the threads on the, on the uh, studs because that will make life easier for you when you go to remount this. The rest of this will come off easily enough with lacquer thinner. This one's really not painted, so no sweat. Okay, guys, that is how I get this mess out of that. Works, works like a charm, and uh, it's a lot less work. You'll put a lot less time into it. It's actually less messy than doing it with your heat gun. It's kind of cool to have it done really fast. All right, I'm gonna take all this garbage. I'm gonna clean up my mess here. You don't really wanna watch that. I'm gonna take all this garbage downstairs and uh, get back to work. All right, as you can see, there are a whole bunch of capacitors that I slid out of that can. I'm gonna mount, I'm gonna put capacitors in this can and I'm gonna run the, the wires out of it through the hole and I'm going to make the wires nice and long so that they can reach where they're going. Now I'll have to cut off some excess and there will be wasted wire, but that's really the best way to do this because otherwise I'm trying to you know, run the wire into the can and try to wire it up and put it together. It'd just be a mess. So I'll start at the can end, make them nice and long, lop them off, and then go and then solder them in place. Now you notice these, this wire here soldered to the box. That is a uh, going to be a nice little ground wire, so I should be able to run this, hook all the capacitors that, that have to go to ground to this guy here. Alrighty, folks. What I'm doing right now looks like a kindergarten construction project. Is uh, I am going to I've got this metal box cleaned out. All right, now I have to fill that with capacitors. Let me see, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven capacitors have to go inside of there. And I need a way to mount them, and I don't want to drill holes, so terminal strips are out. Besides, they'd be hard to work with. And uh, so, what am I going to do? Well, I thought about a phenolic, uh, you know, like printed circuit, you know, perf board. I thought about that, but I'd have to mount that somehow, or it'd just rattle around in there. So, I'm going to go really low tech. And all of you who are really into uh, high-end restorations are going to want to run screaming into the hills. So I suggest you put on your running shoes now because I'm going to show you. All I did was make myself a little cardboard mounting plate or a little cardboard mounting board. 
that I will that I'll hot glue into here. And it's going to fit tightly enough so that even if the hot glue ever failed, it's not going to go anywhere. Plus, I'm going to use um, shrink tubing on all the leads. So really, it's going to be pretty, it'd be pretty hard for this thing to short. The way I put these sides here, I'll make sure that all of the leads are coming out this side over here, see? That way, this will prevent those from touching the side of the box. And the inside of the box has a... Uh, like a wax or a tar paper also. So I think this is going to fix my situation. I'll go ahead and mount it right about, you know, all the way down to the bottom. That'll give me room. Put this cover plate back on if I want to. I'm not yet sure what I want to do there. So I suppose I need to get working. I'll gather up all the capacitors. I'll show you what I got and then we'll uh, draw a plan on this cardboard. You see, uh, Buster's not the only one that ignores the rules of the house. I don't understand how they get away with it. But wifey's just too soft on him, I think. What are you doing on mommy's chair? We're not supposed to be on there. Get off. Get off. Wait, wait. You know, I keep telling her to bring the hammer down on these cats because uh, they're running the show. Boy, what a life, huh? But she won't do it. <laughs> Let him down easy. Oh, were you recording? All right, guys, I've gathered up all my caps. Like I said, there are seven. There's a uh, .5. There are a couple of .25s. I'm going to use some couple of .22s. I think they'll be fine. Um, there's a .05. I'll use a .047. A couple of .03s. Of course, I'll use .033s. And there's a .02, which I'll use a .00022. I like to use these. These are Panasonic film capacitors. I get these from Mauser on Mauser.com. Let me go ahead and lay these out on the cardboard and uh, I will show you when these are all in there and mounted up. Okay guys, wait, let me show you how I'm doing this. I'll show you one of them. I've already mounted the, the what's going to be the .5. I mounted this .47 and uh, I'm going to go ahead and see this is the leads come out the other side. Got some shrink tubing on there just for the heck of it. And I will probably put a little dab of hot glue where each one of these mounts to kind of hold them steady. But it may not be necessary. So let me go ahead and set up those four that are sort of not in parallel, but they share a terminal. Let me see if I can find a creative way to get them to share that terminal. How about if we put that terminal right here in a common spot? Say right, ow, say right there. What do you think? So now we, ow. That was dumb. I think I'll do this. All right, that gets that out of the way. There's a point four seven or point zero four seven. Okay, I'm going to put a little dab of hot glue on there to hold this in place while I work on it. Same here, because I don't like that they wobble around like that. I have gone ahead and mounted uh, five of the capacitors. As you see, all I did was poke holes. Really creative, I suppose. Poked holes that I'll make the connect connections on this side over here. There were four capacitors that all share one terminal in common electrically, so I poked those all through the same hole after all, and, uh, and I'm going to make the connection on this side. But for right now, the things keep falling out as I work on it. I'm gonna, I want to get them all in, mounted up, and then I'll make the connections. So for right now, I'm going to do this here. Again, the purists are going to go screaming. You, I'm sure you've noticed that I'm not really a purist when it comes to these. I try to maintain them historically the best I can, but I have to keep in mind, and probably most of you too, that if we don't go and, you know, put these radios back on the road, so to speak, I don't know who will. Okay, so sometimes we have to be creative because we can't always make them exactly like they were when they were new. And some of us work in this hobby... Um, do not have 40 years of bench experience so that we know every detail of how these things work. So sometimes we have to do things that don't sit well with the total restoration purists. I mean, I can live with that, guys. I don't know about you. I know that if I didn't do some of this work on these radios that I do, these radios would never see the light of day again. They'd sit in an attic, they'd deteriorate until some kid threw them away, um, uh, rather than sell them at the estate auction, if you know what I mean. So um, even though it's not purely authentic, some of the stuff I do, 
I think it's authentic enough to, to uh, pay homage to the original design idea of the radio, the original design intention, and it make, makes the radio work. It makes it so that folks can enjoy it. And I try really hard to not do things that will affect the way it feels or sounds or how well it operates. All I really affect is things like this, where, you know, instead of one style of mounting, I'm changing to a different style of mounting. But that will, this will not affect at all how the radio sounds and how, how it performs. And the fact is, it'll be tucked inside of here, and people won't even know it's there unless they're looking for it. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. You know, your mileage may vary. Everybody's got their own way of doing things. And uh, I sure as hell am not going to try to pretend I'm an expert. I'm just explaining to those that wonder why I'm doing it this way. I'm explaining why. I have mentioned several times before, you know, I'm working on this customer radio and that customer radio. I, I didn't start out with the intent of working on other people's radios. I really love the hobby and I just wanted to work on mine, to be honest with you. One day a guy calls me and said he had been down at Ray Elko, and I had visited Ray Elko back then. This was about five years ago. Said he'd been to Ray Elko, and uh, the owner of Ray Elko mentioned that he knew somebody that worked on radios. This guy that visited Ray Elko was looking for somebody to help him with his Zenith 8S463. And Robert at Ray Elko, we weren't, you know, we didn't know each other too well then. We just had met, but that's it. He said, hey, I know somebody that works on those for himself. He maybe will help you with that. So this, this fella called me, brought his radio to me, and it took me a long time. It was my first, you know, radio project that I, you know, my first big console that I'd ever done. I'd only done small tabletops at that point. Um, he brought this thing to me, and, you know, it took a few months, but I got through it. And the next thing you know... Um, word of mouth and Robert suggesting all that. I had a whole bunch of people's radios. They're wanting me to help them, and I've just been steadily kind of improving what I do, little by little. Um, but uh, you know, it's uh, it, it, it was something that I fell into totally by accident, and uh, now I find myself with more other of other people's radios to work on than of my own. But you know, I, I'm uh, I'm learning to manage it. All right, so now these are all glued in here. Now I'm just going to bend them a little bit so that they, the ones that need to be separate are separate. This does not have to be fancy, okay? It does not have to be fancy. All right, so I've got, let's see, I've installed one, two, three, four, five. I've got two more to install, and those two share a terminal. Those are the 2.03s. These two capacitors need, these 0.03s, they need to be safety capacitors. They are going from line to ground. And uh, so, and they don't have to exactly be 0.03. They just need to be safety capacitors in the neighborhood. So let me go get a couple of safety capacitors and we'll make that good. I'm glad I caught that before I went and put those in. I just wasn't thinking. You know, that doesn't happen but about every 10 minutes. All right, guys, got a couple of safety capacitors. These are not 0.03s. That's kind of an odd size for a safety capacitor, I think. I don't know that, but I think it is. These are 0.05s. They'll work just fine. I have a really nice supply of these. I, I um, bought like an ammo roll full of them, and they, they, I use them all the time. It doesn't really matter what, whether it's 0.03 or 0.05 or 0.01 or whatever. As, as long as it's a safety capacitor, the whole point of the safety capacitor is to keep noise from getting to the radio through the line, um, the line supply. But that's its only purpose, really, uh, of, of a filter capacitor. It, uh, it doesn't affect the performance of the radio in any other way. Um, but what it does need to be is one that, if it, if it fails, it doesn't fail as a short. And that's what a safety capacitor is all about. And that's what these are, so I'll go ahead and get these installed. Okay, so I twisted these all to get these two together here, just to keep them together so I don't get them mixed up. I'll, I'll run solder down. It's going to be a good connection, don't worry. But for right now, I just kind of wanted to get it in place so I could do this. All right, just get a little bit of hot glue there, a little bit of hot glue there. I think that's wifey telling me that she's got brunch ready for me. She's making me some eggs and bacon and... And uh, all, all the goodies that go with breakfast. I, I, I keep, I've told you before, and I'll tell you again, I am a spoiled dude. I am the luckiest guy in the world when it comes to the wifey I chose. 
Um, don't tell her that. Okay, there are some things you just don't need to tell the wifey, all right? Um, you know, that's, uh, you don't want her to get a big head. <laughs> all right, and if you believe that, uh, I, I got some uh, oceanfront property near, near Phoenix that I'll sell you. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and let this hot glue cool. But before I go have breakfast, let me show you something. I am, I'm trying to learn this 3D printing thing, as you know. And uh, this thing is crude. But there is one of my first attempts at a knob. It's not quite perfect, guys. Okay, so the Zenith logo is a little bit uh, soft there. Okay. But the shape of it is good. Now I've got to learn how to do multi-scans and mesh them together so that I get one good shape out of it that includes all the detail. I'm getting there. It just takes time. It's, it's actually um, not as easy as it sounds. You don't just plug in the scanner and away you go. It takes, uh, it takes some practice. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, practice on that stuff. I mean, it, it's not bad. So I'm going to be uh, getting there soon. All right, I'll show you my progress as I go, guys. Well, guys... It's not elegant or pretty, but it's going to work. All the wires are connected to the appropriate places on, for these capacitors. And I also color-coded these wires are the, you know, the approximate right colors for what they're going to be doing. And of course, they're color-coded they're, they're color to the, the schema as well. All right, I'll go ahead and slip this in the box now. And uh, it's really simple, just uh, drop it down in there. I do not want to, uh, to glue this thing, glue the snot out of this into the box because I want to be able to get it out if I need to, all right? I'll drop these down in here. And I set this up so that the capacitors could be tucked down into this recess of this and so I could favor this side so there's plenty of room for these terminals, all right? And uh, you just go ahead and slip this in. I may not have to glue this at all. There we go. That's not going anywhere, man. That's not going anywhere. Let's take a look down inside there to be sure. Yup. That's not going anywhere. And of course these wires will poke out through the hole in this guy here. Now, these wires are all not going to fit through this guy, and that's one of the reasons I'm not sure I want to use this guy. So, uh, I might just dispense with this piece altogether and just fold these tabs over and call that good. I think that's the best way to go. There we go. It's, it's down in there for good now. All right, let me, let me, I still have the hot glue gun, so let me just put a little glue here to stabilize this thing. No big deal. It'll just keep it from moving. And then if I need to get it out, I just heat those two spots where I have the glue. So I'll connect this up here, this white wire, to this ground terminal here. And then this outside one goes off to a ground. So I'm going to make that connection first. Because it's easy. I'll just tuck that wire down there. All these wires here will be will come out of that hole in the chassis, and uh, I may have to make that hole a little bit bigger. I'm not sure yet. I'll see. All right. Okay, I opened up that hole a little bit so that I could fit this stuff down through there. So let me go ahead and get that part done because I need to get this thing mounted up. Take this tape off of here. I always put tape anytime I do any kind of uh, work that involves metal filings, I always put tape over the tube sockets because that's the last place in the world I want to get metal filings. So, let's get these wires started in here. If I do it right, they should all fit. They all fit with the hole the way it was, but it was a little tight and I was worried about uh, cutting through the insulation over time. So, use a grommet there. I don't think I'll need to. This is really thick insulation on this wire and there's not going to be any, any movement after I install it. So I think I should be okay. Normally I install a grommet but there's no room for that on this. So making the hole bigger was about all I could do. 
but there's no room for a grommet. Besides, it would interfere with the mounting of the box, right? Because the hole sits right on the edge of where the box sits. So that's uh, it's just going to have to suffice with just a bigger hole, and it's loose. There's there's gonna, there's no binding whatsoever in this. So now what I need to do is turn this this way. Okay, and this guy here is going to probably go in a, on a screw. I'll just feed it through carefully. Also, bend these wires so that they all meet at the hole and they don't... Oh, you know what? I forgot to do this, guys. These tabs held down that, uh, that cardboard bottom. But I'm not going to put that bottom on there because there's enough interfering with mounting this as it is. So I'll just fold these tabs over and if I'm real gentle about it, they'll still be there if the next person that gets in here wants to use them. Alright. Go ahead and finish feeding these wires through. It's going to be a little tricky because they don't come out at exactly the same place that the other ones did, but it's pretty darn close. And you get to this point and you start pulling them through individually, okay? Just nice and gentle. See these orange ones are my most troublesome ones. But I don't want to pull them too much because then they won't have the bend they need to clear to the hole. So just a millimeter at a time. There we go. Looky there, guys. Looky there. Oops. See, they're still nice and loose. Still plenty of room for them. Now all I have to do is remember where the heck I put the uh, uh, where I put the nuts for these things. Then let's get a couple of star washers. Okay, it's time to place that order on Amazon. I'm just about out of star washers, guys, of the size I can use. Just a few left. The rest are a size I should never have bought, but I'm sure not going to throw them away because the minute I do, I'll need them for something. Oh yeah, those threads are nicely clean. The rest of the nut isn't very clean, but the threads stayed mostly clean when I was working on it. All right, let's take a look at it as I screw it in, okay? Trusty old Craftsman wrench. Boy, I don't see those anymore. Are they still making Craftsman stuff? Some of it, somebody else buy the brand, perhaps? All right, tighten these buggers down just for, to make it right. Don't over tighten it. Don't ape the thing. The way I do it, the way I know when I'm doing quarter inch stuff, my thumb and my finger when I get to the tightening point, okay? That's about all you need. Don't go crazy on it, okay? That's how you strip threads or break hardware. That's about right, right there. There you go. Okay, they make the wrench short for a reason. You don't want to put too much torque on it, you break the thing. Okay. There you go. There is the box. Okay. All these things are now in, officially in the way again. And there's still plenty, you see, there's still plenty of room for these to move. All right, so we're good there. And uh, next I'll start attaching those wires where they go. But first got to clean my mess up before I, I scream. I don't like the bench to get too messy. Now this is every day at my house, guys. Um, these guys, uh, they never stop fighting. It's really not fighting, they're just wrestling, you know. But truth is, Freddy kind of pushes Buster around. Um, Buster gets kind of ticked off, and Freddy's just funning with him. 
So uh, Fred will push Buster's buttons until Buster starts howling. So let's watch this for a few minutes as I fin for a few minutes as I close out this video. Uh, we spent way too much time on this one. So from your Western Outpost in Salt Lake City, this is Michael. Oh, by the way, listening to you're listening to old sixty four goat on the YouTube. This is Michael, and that's all for now. Or what diagram I may be pointing at. Because right now, I usually have to set my little mini tripod up on the bench, like I did with this, and have it point, have the camera pointed down like this. Which is fine for certain things, but if I get equipment on the bench, I'm not going to have room to do that. Um, you may have noticed that the monitor is going off of the uh, bench here. I got it up here. I got it up here in the corner, and um, it's going to be used for my security system so I can see if somebody's outside the door. Um, I can still hook it up to this here. I got the um, cable put up there in the back of the monitor so I can just run it around and connect it to here. But that means I have to look up to my left to watch the monitor if I'm doing my soldering, and that's a little bit too far away for me to see detail. I need to have the monitor here, so I'm, I've still got to get myself a flat screen with a composite video input. Now, I was looking at the one I had mentioned uh, in one of my other videos when I was talking about the monitor I saw at the Christmas tree shop.